at all. And yeah, let let whoever um, let people in. That's fine. Oh yeah, here we go. Is it just focused on the screen? <laughs> So everyone online will be able to see your screen and the camera as well. Yes. Yes, I'm on mic. That was four years ago. Yes, that was nice. It's very cold, it's snowing, it's raining, it's miserable. So um, just look out there. And my dad, we promised that. My dad was freaking out. They're going to freeze to death, right? I'm like, yeah, but they've got the insulation in house these days. And I'm like, it's raining on the square. Yes, you can freeze to death. People got stuck on the category in the south. I saw that, yeah, that's most unusual. Yeah, in... yeah it was because it was completely just icy on the highway. And all the. That's what we get in, in the UK with two inches of snow, we, you know, people get stuck on the highways, but yeah. you don't expect that in Sweden because you have all the gritters, don't you, out there? And... Well, so in Sweden, it's a law, you actually have to have the weakest value with spiders on Oh, okay. So otherwise you can't drive on ice. Yeah, wow. Well. That's the only thing that you can do on the ice. But then we bought the cups coming from Europe. They don't have spikes on there, and that's what causes... Wow. Okay, so um, it's two o'clock, so I would like to welcome you to our seminar this afternoon with Professor Yvonne Rogers. Uh, Yvonne is here in Australia uh, visiting, and she's from University College London. Many of you from the field of human-computer interaction will know Yvonne, uh, and you may know her because you may have read her book, Interaction Design Beyond Human-Computer Interaction. It's one of the canonical textbooks of human-computer interaction, and it has sold more than 200,000 copies worldwide. Um, so uh, Yvonne is very noted in our field for um, leading new directions in thinking, and so I'm very pleased today that she's going to talk to us about empowering children to think with technology 
from ubiquitous computing to chat GPT. Thank you. Thank you very much, Margot. Um, it's a great pleasure to be back in this sunny Queensland and in particular Brisbane. And I'd like to thank the Digital Child for sponsoring my trip to Brisbane. Um, and then in the next week I'm off to Melbourne, so hope to see people there. But um, uh, I'm going to talk today about some of my research, which started 20, 30 years ago, but then move through to see what common themes there are and what challenges that we face today. So this is a picture of one of my first projects called Ambient Wood, where the group of girls are looking at a video, which is not in the classroom, but it's outdoors in the woodland in this strange looking contraption called a periscope. So, as I said, for my talk, I'm going to start off um, talking about how we use ubiquitous computing when it first came out to inspire children to learn. And then I'll talk a bit about the work we did using physical computing and tangibles to get children and students to, to think and to reflect on what they're learning. And then I'll move on to some recent research, which is uh, very topical, thinking about virtual agents and assistants and how we can design those to be part of a learning experience to facilitate deep learning. And then finally speculate about how we might move beyond the uh, discourse about Gen AI, general, Gen AI and cheating to how we might use it to open children's minds up. So this is when I started my uh, career. This is the kind of uh, classroom that we would see for computing. Um, where they're sitting in front of a row of uh, big fat old PCs, not talking to each other, but completing tasks. And it was for me quite depressing to see this is where computing was. 30 years on, you may be familiar with this uh, image. We, when during the pandemic, Microsoft came up with uh, uh, a background called Teams Together. And the idea was that whilst we were learning remotely, we could pretend that we were physically together and all happily smiling and learning in this way. When I first tried using this, I was so hopeful that my students would join me. But this was a reality which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Uh, the person up in the top left is the uh, instructor or the teacher uh, trying to get the students to join in. But as we know, students really didn't like having cameras faced at them, particularly if they were in their bedrooms. Um, and so it quickly became the norm that they would turn their cameras off, despite our attempts to, to ask them to turn them on. And so um, online learning and learning from 30 years ago were far from ideal in my mind. And I think um, students have very different ideas about how they want to learn. And we need to tap into that somehow. What is it you know, that gets them excited, inspired and curious? And that's been very much behind uh, my uh, research and, and thinking about how we can design technology um, to do that. So, as I said, the beginning of my uh, career was very much, uh, there was all this new technology coming out, uh, mobile technologies, sensors, um, and the beginnings of you know, using Wi-Fi. And so we set about thinking about how we could move computers and technology out of the classroom into the wild and very much wanting to encourage children to initiate their own learning um, and thinking, but also to promote scientific inquiry in a way that excited them rather than was rather dull and inspire curiosity. So our first project, and it's been hi there, uh, much um, publicized was Ambient Wood. And one of my colleagues happened to just have a woodland uh, in the university I was at, which was Sussex in, in Brighton, and said, yeah, sure, you can use our woodland, do whatever you like there. Um, so we were given this woodland to just put technology into and experiment with. And it had lots of different bits to it. It had open grass, it had woodland, it had ponds and so on. So we could start to think creatively about how children could go into this woodland. Many children hadn't gone into woodlands like this before and get them to use technology in quite creative ways to explore, to discover, but also to look to see the invisible and make it visible. So there was a, tea, a motley team of us, engineers, psychologists, designers, philosophers, uh, and computer scientists working together from different universities. We even had someone from Australia, Ted Phelps. I don't know if any of you know of him, but he helped us very much with the infrastructure. 
and we designed all manner of innovative technologies. So before smartphones uh, came along, we developed our own or customized our own probing devices that could probe uh, different aspects. And in this case, it was moisture levels and light levels. We also created our own handheld displays from what were called PDAs in those days, personal digital assistants, uh, to provide feedback and in situ information. And then, as I mentioned at the beginning, we had wildlife videos. This one was a David Attenborough one. But when they came across them, this periscope would start playing for about two minutes. And the idea was that they would watch the video in situ and then think about what they'd seen and then look around them, which doesn't often happen when you watch a video in the classroom. So um, the underlying theme was that we weren't trying to be prescriptive. We were trying very much to get the children to learn themselves through exploring and discovering. And we wanted them to, to notice things that they might not and to look in different ways. And so some of our devices were designed to encourage them to do this. So an example was um, if you walk past something, it's a physical action, it would cause a digital effect. And this thing here was called an ambient horn. So they would hold this and if they walk past something, it would make a honking noise. And then they'd hold it to their ear and a sound would play and they would have to guess what that sound was. And some of you have heard this before, but it always makes me smile when I hear it. Tell me what you think this is. Oh, no. Anyone want to have a guess? It's something, yes, yes. Yes, it was a butterfly sipping nectar. It wasn't real, we made it, but that's what we should. <laughs> but the idea was to get the children to think, what, do these, what does this sound like? Because it's normally inaudible. And so it was to encourage them to use their imagination to think, well, that might be that. And so we had lots of these abstract sounds. We had one for photosynthesis which was quite abstract. What does that sound like? But it was all about getting them to think about things which they wouldn't normally in situ. And so, as you can see, uh, they really uh, um, enjoyed using these technologies we developed. And once we'd got our, uh, in, our Wi-Fi system set up uh, and we got all the devices working, we got pairs of children to go off into the woodland. We just said, go off for an hour and discover things. And here's the devices. They couldn't stop probing everything that they came across. So whether it was the air, the ground, the trees, um, foliage, to see what the light levels and the moisture levels were. And being kids, they wanted to get extreme. So they tried to get the most, the wettest and the darkest and the lightest and the driest. And that's what kids are, they try to reach it. And they also, you can see on the image here on the left, this guy's um, measuring his armpit to see how damp that was. Um, so they had fun as well, which is part of it. It's like, we're not saying you can only do this or that. It's very much for them to explore and use these types of devices. Another design uh, principle we had was not to give each child their own device, but to share them. So one child, this one on the left, had uh, the probing device and all you could do was press a button and switch it between the two modes whether it's light or moisture and that's all he could do he couldn't read it he then had to go to the other device that the child was holding to read it and we didn't have uh, numbers it was just these simple visualizations so for high level light you sh it was this big yellow glowing uh, circle and for medium moisture it just had this level and so they could see relative levels uh, rather than trying to do the numbers and each time they got one reading, they'd run off to try and get something that was higher or lower than that. And we couldn't stop them. They'd got two, 300 of these readings and they, they just really enjoyed exploring. And here are two girls. We also gave them walkie talkies so they could talk to their teachers or to each other about what they were discovering. So that's why they've got something in both hands. But here you can see this one girl on the left is desperate to try to, to take a reading of, of the ground and the other one is reading it out. Yeah, it's much harder. Oh, right, so it's much worse. Should we try a leaf? Don't get to it here again. Oh, no, I just... One of them is a 
exactly the same. Oh, is there the same colour? Yeah. How about you try dry, dry leaf? Try something else. So, and that's the kind of discourse that went on by having two of them doing it together. They would discuss and generate these hypotheses. Little did they know that we took uh, every probe they took, we recorded it, and then Ted, who's there, put it onto this bird's eye view of the area they'd been at. And there were lots of little dots, which is where they'd taken each probe. And what they could do is they came back to this makeshift classroom when we finally got them to come back. They could then see where their particular, the two of them had probed and other kids had probed. They were so fascinated that that was possible. And they would try and guess what the light or moisture level was for a certain area, depending on what their memory of where they were. Was it in the open area? Was it in uh, you know, the, the deep forest area? And that got them talking to each other. Normally 12, 10 to 12 year olds, it's really hard afterwards to get them to discuss what they found. But these kids just, it just felt natural to them to talk about this and to guess. So there was a lot of um, comparing and hypothesizing about what um, was behind, why was it there, that there was a, a high level of moisture or light. And so they talked about where the plants grew in the wetter areas of the wood um, and what creatures and insects thrived in the woodland. So this w was a really nice way of ending um, being in the woodland. They then went back to the classroom and did more activities, but that's for another day. But I think the point here was that we, if I'm allowed to say, changed or transformed um, learning with technology from that to, um, well, that's the team. So I think um, exhausted because it did take a lot to do that. But a very new way of thinking about how to design technology rather than computers in the classroom to encourage children to think differently and to dare to do things differently and to enjoy doing this kind of science in situ. And we brought the indoor and outdoors together. So instead of watching stuff in the classroom and then going out to look at it, we reversed that. So they actually saw things outside um, on the videos. And the, the joy for us was how much they talked to each other and to us about what they were discovering. They were so excited. And I say this, this is probably now 15 years or more, um, that I met uh, a couple of them five years ago. And they say the thing they only remember about school was the ambient wood going on that. They absolutely loved it. Um, so not only did they get um, this curiosity about why things grow in ecosystems and how you might sense it. They were also fascinated by the technology that we'd set up. How did we, you know, what were these handheld devices? How did they work? And they then went around trying to find where we'd put things in the trees in order to get our, our system up and running. They didn't luckily try and you know, take them down. <laughs> we'd put them high up, but it was, so they were learning about the technology that supported it, as well as learning about the, the, the ecosystems so I think that led me um, in my career to argue very much that ubiquitous computing in, in the form of these uh, sensor technologies and handheld devices and the way in which data uh, can be moved around them can be designed to be exciting and stimulating and provocative. And I wrote a paper back in 2006 about that, um, which was very much well received because it was very different to what people were talking about at the time. And particularly at the time, it was very much, we should design technology to be uh, developed that makes our lives efficient and easy. How can we get them to do, enable us to do our tasks in, in that way? And I was saying, no, no, let's not do that. Let's design technology, actually engage people, get them to think. And uh, last year or the year before now, I then revisited uh, how ubiquitous computing and pervasive computing has evolved over the years and whether anyone listened to me, but probably not, but there we go. Um, so what next? So that was back in the two, early 2000s. How has technology advanced? What technology developments are there that can encourage new ways of learning? And in particular, getting children to look like this one here where they're um, active and reflective and they're talking to who's next to them and that they can facilitate more understanding and creativity and hopefully insights. Well, there's lots of technology out there. So we saw how we had PCs and then tablets and mobiles, and then ubiquitous computing turned into the Internet of Things. 
And then tangible and physical computing came along where the physical was combined with the digital to create all sorts of interesting artifacts. We've seen over the years how augmented reality and virtual reality have evolved to be possible for us to, to think about how to design in learning. And then we've seen the advent of wearables, which um, many people have um, been using. And then in the last five, 10 years, there's been agents, robots and chatbots, and now gener generative AI. So how do we decide how to use these and to match up with the kinds of learning we're uh, interested in? And part of what we do in our research is to think, well, what are we trying to get kids to do? We don't just want them to learn facts and be able to regurgitate those. Um, we want them to learn life skills. We want them to think and be creative. We want them to plan, we want them to decide, we want them to choose between options, to reason, to make sense of data, to reflect on their learning at a meta level, to even contemplate and to solve problems. So there are lots of things we could focus on and maybe you know one of those or more of those. And so part of what we do is to think about what might be suitable technology to match up. So would it be the case that we would use PCs for problem solving or for planning or for wearables for planning or uh, tangibles for reflecting or so on and so off? There's lots of ways in which you can match them up. And frankly, there is no obvious way. It depends on many factors. But it is interesting to think about which might be best suited. Some of them are much cheaper and more affordable to develop and others have got more um, functionality. So this is where I think it's you know, useful to go back to um, old school theories of learning. And I don't know how many of you have read any of these, but they've been around now for a long time. Works by Papet, Vygotsky, Jerry Bruner. That's Jerry Bruner on the right there uh, when I met him in his 90s. Uh, Piaget, uh, Edith Ackerman and Mitch Resnick, who were very much behind the logo work. Um, with the turtle. And I like going back sometimes and reading some of their works and getting inspired by what they were talking about, because I think it's still very relevant today. And one that always stays with me is this uh, quote from Piaget, which is when you teach a child something, you take away forever his chance of discovering it for himself. And that's quite profound when you think about that, is that we spoon feed too much. But if you let them discover like we did in Ambient Wood, they may remember that much better or use that in a different way. And then Jerry Bruner, this one here about amplification. To assist the development of the powers of the mind is to provide amplification systems to which human beings equipped with appropriate skills can link themselves. So this is about thinking about how you can amplify the mind. And that's something that's very much behind my motivation for thinking about how we use the different technologies to support all of these different learning processes. And there's three main areas where I've focused a lot on where I've, I've loosely applied these old school theories. One is to do with um, scaffolded learning, which comes from Vygotsky um, and the zone of proximal development. The idea here is to provide guidance through the technology to support children to learn more complex um, skills and be able to do them by themselves and to reflect on those. Another one which uh, has been very much uh, throughout my research is how do we help people to externalize what's going on in their heads? And uh, this started way back with the work on Logo and the physical turtle, where you get people to think about programming by moving a physical object around. So externalizing through manipulating physical objects. And then the third one, which is very much, I think, central to all learning or should be is collaborative learning, where we get small groups learning together through joint problem solving, because that way they can talk to each other um, and to externalize and so on. So those are the three pillars, if you like, that has very much driven my research. And then each time a new technology comes along, I'm always excited by the next technology. I can't wait to get my hands on the Apple new um, glasses that are coming out next month, but that's another day. So we think about what has the affordances for physical computing, for agents, for AI, and to start thinking about how you match these up. And as I said, there's no one-to-one -one mapping. It's very much thinking about the affordances of these, the key learning processes you're trying to develop and the sort of conceptual frameworks that you can apply to bring these together. 
So I am now going to uh, provide a couple of case studies of um, uh, research that I've been doing in, in the last few years, where I've tried to do this marrying together of the affordances with some of the conceptual ideas. This is a project called Data Moves, and we worked with, uh, um, again, it was, you know, people from quite different backgrounds. So we worked with uh, the Wayne McGregor a studio um, that was supporting and funding this. We also worked with a choreographer and a dancer, and we also worked with a computer science educationalist. And they asked us to come along and design some technology that would motivate the kids to learn about computing and in particular uh, number systems and so what we try to do is think about how could we design something that was engaging but could provide some scaffolding but wasn't very much at the forefront it was sort of at the back um, of their learning so i'm going to play this video and you'll be able to see um, how we went about it and how what we tried to do was create workshops for half a day that the kids would come to so children from computer science and children who were specializing in dance could come together to learn about these concepts the volume does go up This one has a battery, a charger, and all the other necessary components inside. So that means we could actually visualize body movement in space. So since this one's only capable of displaying a movement in a single location, we use these base stations that have um, eight time of flight sensors. The range of these sensors is four meters that means if this is put on the floor, we have a diameter of eight meters that people could stand around. Um, and then we can visualize sound, different visuals, and how people just traverse space overall. Working with Sue, I think we're gonna combine movement and this uh, physical computing tool uh, to create a workshop. And the workshop's going to be based around data visualization, binary and data representation for key stage three students. We're going to further develop that workshop uh, with Studio Wayne McGregor and um, Suzanne from UCL. And uh, then we're going to be delivering that in December to students. Yes. We hope the outcomes are an increased ability to understand these key stage three concepts, um, to learn and embed what are sometimes very abstract concepts and sometimes very thing things that are very tough to wrap your head around. But hopefully through the movement and through these tools, we're able to kind of create some more ways in. Key stage three is the part where the students will be making decisions about their next steps in their education. Um, and a lot of the time, they feel that computing isn't something that's relevant to them or interesting to them. And hopefully presenting it in a completely different way will show them that actually it can be really creative. Um, it can inform decisions about what they might do in other areas of their, um, their interests, sports, um, drama, music, um, choreography, art, uh, all sorts of areas. Um, so it connects in really nicely with all sorts of things. I think it's also important to say that if, um, if dance will help more girls be interested in computing, then perhaps computing with dance um, will help more boys be interested in dance.
it's very interesting, it's very intellectual and I like the fact that it crosses over with um, technology because it shows people that dance isn't just about the dancing, it's the, it also connects into lots of other, um, other areas and subject areas. The video goes on for quite a while, but you can see how we worked alongside, it might even be called a co-design workshop, with teachers, with the students who came along, but also with uh, dance professionals and with uh, computer science educationalists. And our role was very much not to be there to dictate what the technology should do, but it was there to think, well, how can we design something that could be just in the background that can help them think a bit about joining these together? So we developed an in-person workshop that the idea was that those uh, two that were interviewed could go around the, the UK. Unfortunately, this was just before COVID, but they did manage to do two or three. And they could run these workshops all through the country um, having tested these and having the technology and they would be half day workshops. So thinking very much about how you can scale it up from just being in your own uh, school. And so um, they would learn about uh, the number systems of binary, ASCII, but also they'd learn about uh, pixels and the resolution. Um, and if you want to read more about this, it was published in DIS, a great conference um, in 2001. But these, if you saw in the video, were some of the tangibles. And, and this is uh, one of the, uh, PH, the postdocs who was working on it, just came up with this idea. He was inspired about how we can draw using our limbs. And so these um, were used as the wearables. And what you could do is you could switch between different representations. So it could be just um, one bit, which as you can see is the monochrome black and white, that's what it would appear. And then you could switch to two bits. And if you moved your arm around, you'd get this kind of um, a bit sort of uh, uh, discrete um, design with a few colors. Then if you go to four bit, it's a bit smoother. And the eight bit shows um, uh, more colors and much smoother. So the idea here is that, um, that the higher the bit um, representation, the more information is being displayed. Um, and that's how we were getting them to e experiment and try out with those um, number representations. Then with the base, uh, you could act as a bit as well. And then you could be a zero or a one. So the idea here wasn't to be prescriptive, but for them just to explore what it meant and to see the visualizations that were drawn as a result of that. And then they could be uh, discrete, uh, one or a zero, um, and we could have different uh, visualizations that was being played when they moved around at the base. So the workshop, that also took some time to think about how we could switch between using the technology, doing the activities and doing some learning. And as you saw in the video, that they weren't sat down at tables, she was actually teaching on the wall, and so they were very much standing up. But the idea is that they would move through these different activities to then preparing their own uh, group project um, to explain two of the computing concepts that they'd been taught. And then they did their presentations in front of everyone. And that's what it looked like at the end. They just absolutely loved it. They had a fantastic time. Uh, we had um, up to about 20 kids in each workshop. And then what we have to do, because the funding was from the government, is you have to work out a way to evaluate these types of workshops. And we didn't just want to do a survey. And so another project we worked on was called EvalMe. And we wanted to think of getting the kids to reflect a bit more on their learning experience in a different way than just filling in a survey. And this is a novel, tangible device that, again, was developed by um, one of the postdocs working on the project. And essentially, it has three dials that go from 1 to 12. And as you move the dial around, the LED lights light up. And you can have three questions at each time. And then you can just unscrew this and put in another sheet. So you can put in different questions at different stages of the workshop. So this one here says, data is something I can play with. Information about me is valuable. I'm having fun. And what we found is we built two of these. There were prototypes uh, that, again, we didn't want to give one to each student. We wanted them to, to look at it together. And you can see here how much they were 
talking and sharing and thinking about the questions that were being asked. Some of the kids took it off uh, by themselves and others answered it together. And it didn't matter because we weren't interested in getting just one student's feedback. We wanted to get the sort of, if you like, a holistic overview um, of how students thought about the different activities. We then thought it would be quite an interesting idea to present back the data that had been collected through using this device. So our, this was used about three times through the workshop, after the first activity, and then after lunch, and then at the end. And what we found was when we presented the data back to the kids in the kind of conventional bar chart, they didn't, they were really quiet, they didn't say anything. It was complete opposite to how when they were using the device. And the reason for this is we think that it was, you know, they're sitting there, it's probably at the end of the day, it's an unfamiliar task to be asking them to reflect on the scores that they'd given. And we actually had to encourage them and lead them through. Um, and so that trying to give them back feedback wasn't perhaps um, a good idea for this workshop. But it was interesting to see how you can transform how you get feedback in a way that the, the educationists and the teachers found it really useful to, to see it like this, rather than just having a set of Likert scales. So this idea of using physical computing or tangibles is something that I've done quite a lot of research on. And um, we also did a, a project with much younger children who find it even harder to express themselves. Uh, particularly those between the age of four and seven. So when they've uh, had a learning experience or when they've gone to a performance or something, if you want to get feedback on how well it went, it can be quite hard to get kids to, to, of this age. So this is a project, again, it wasn't just us, it was through working with the Young Vic, which is a theatre in London that specialises in working with children, and a company called Fevered Sleep. And they created this interactive performance where the protagonist, which is this guy sitting on a tree with a tail and horns, comes into the, a dark space and welcomes 20 young children who are sitting on the floor and gives them all a tail to put on. And then they all go through that red door, a bit like um, a little red riding hood type experience to go into a woodland and they follow him on his adventures and he discovers all these creatures and he gets lost he needs to get home and eventually he finds his way home there's a really nice interactive story that the kids love and afterwards uh, you know they they were very immersed for an hour we then came up with a way to get them to evaluate their experience and it was called the small talk project um, and we built these physical devices, a bit similar to Evalmi, which were essentially boxes that had um, buttons and dials and spinners and a microphone and a video. And that they would go to each of these boxes to answer specific questions about the performance that they'd just watched. And we started off with a really simple yellow box and went on to the green box. So the yellow box simply asked them, how old are you? Did you come with the school or family? For those children who couldn't read, it, you could have audio, so um, or they couldn't see. On box, by the time they got to box five, the questions were a bit more detailed, and it was the protagonist who was um, in the video there, and they had to reply by speaking into the microphone, which is just there to the right. And some of the questions they would ask is, "Hey, it's so good to see you again. Where? What did you see?" And they would then talk into the microphone. You were watching me on my journey. What did I do? Lots of things happened on my journey. How did it make you feel? Some things on my journey made me sad. What made me sad? So they were quite detailed questions that usually is quite hard to elicit, but these kids just loved answering, talking to the protagonist through the microphone. and got quite detailed answers, which the uh, educationists had never got that before. So here they are all queuing up after the performance, um, interacting with the various boxes one by one. Some of the really young children had to be helped, but the older ones, the six to seven year olds, had no trouble at all. So in the study that we report in the paper, there were 63 children that took part after seeing the performance and nearly, you know, a good 68% of them provided spoken answers. And a few of the youngest, the four year olds didn't speak and it was hard to get them to speak. But they were thoughtful and reflective in their answers and they mentioned lots of things that they saw in the production. They said they felt happy, excited, sad or silly at certain points. And they all mentioned some aspects of the journey that the protagonist went on, whether it was on a boat trying to find a family and so on and what made him sad. So really quite detailed answers. 
um, which the, uh, the education at the, at the theatre was very pleased with. So the benefits here, if we think about those two projects of using tangible devices for eliciting feedback, is that it can enable children of different ages to step back and reflect and say things and talk about specific experiences that they might not otherwise. You can also get that over the shoulder learning or watching which influences their choices. It makes them think, do I feel like this or not? Um, if you just want individual uh, responses, then obviously that's going to affect it. But we weren't interested in just what each individual student thought. And, and in both of the uh, um, studies, it was really helpful for the teachers. They could glean more about their perceptions, their level of engagement and their reflections and helping them to get more funding for doing other projects. So I'm now going to move on to a different technology. Um, and this is something I've been working on uh, in the last two or three years, which is because of COVID, we had to stop going into our lab to build these physical tangible devices. And so had to, like most of us, pivot towards thinking about what we could do. So um, um, we thought very much about how can we design conversational agents that could appear um, through smart speakers or on people's smartphones or large displays that could facilitate collaborative learning. And conversational agents have been used for a long time in education. It's nothing new. The, the field of intelligent tutoring systems have for a long time tried to think about how you might try and design an agent to simulate a teacher so that a child can learn by themselves um, at their particular level and provide the right level of scaffolding. And now many of these um, systems uh, will adopt, uh, will have an avatar appear as if it was a person that was trying to motivate them. And they can be customized or personalized to give different types of feedback to a student. So essentially what has been happening is that they're trying to simulate a human tutor by holding a conversation. Here's one of the earlier ones, which is called auto tutor. And as you can see, it's broken up. It's meant for a, a PC or a laptop. You have different windows. So at the top, is um, a question that's being asked to the student. Um, this is a C, uh, IT course. How does the operating system interact with the word processing program when you create a document? Um, not my favorite way of teaching, but that's the kind of question that was being asked. Um, and over here is the, uh, the avatar tutor. And over here is a, the simulation of, of how it works. And then the student types in their response here. And then over here is the log of their previous responses. So just to play the video, watch the avatar and think about, you know, is she motivating? Students typing over on the right. It's just gradually moving the head up and down like this. Possibly. Oh, we've covered this angle pretty well, but something's missing. Is there anything you can add to that? It's not normally that loud, but anyway, so <laughs> that certainly would wake you up, <laughs> whether it would motivate you. So um, the idea here is to use the avatar to emulate, but it's not quite right yet. And I think there's been advances made, but that's the sort of typical approach. We decided to take a different approach to thinking about how we can facilitate collaborative learning. And this goes back to my view that learning could be very much about um, small groups working together, talking to each other, interacting when they're doing tasks rather than one student sat in front of a computer. So this project uh, was with uh, one of my PhD students, Leon Reichert. And we worked, uh, well, the project was called Voice Fizz, and the idea was to help teams uh, analyze and make sense of complex data or visualizations like the one there on the right. We actually worked with adults on this project um, rather than students, but we think the findings we found would are applicable to uh, groups of students who are learning about data um, and data analysis. So our approach was to develop our um, agent, which we call Visi, that would probe um, teams of, of uh, participants 
to get them to talk more with each other, a bit like we did with the ambient wood, and guide them where to look and facilitate sense making and give them the right scaffolding via giving them voice prompts at key moments. So that was how we thought about it, very different from the auto tutor approach. And this um, agent, Vizzy, uh, would uh, prompt teams when it appeared that they got stuck. And the idea was to get them to hypothesize about a data visualization uh, that was um, shown on a, on a shared screen. And it did this. We spent a lot of time thinking about what questions the uh, agent should ask. We wanted them to be open-ended uh, rather than too specific. So things like, do you need a hint for analyzing X? What do you think of this? Shall we move on? Did you consider the difference between variable X and Y? And what might have caused a sudden spike? So the idea here was to get them to think about something that they may not have um, or have overlooked. So the data, we, we spent ages trying to get a data set uh, that complied with GDPR and that was uh, publicly available. And in the end, we got this data set that was provided for us, which was a obesity data for the period of 1990 to 2012. And at that time, obesity levels globally were just going like this. And in certain uh, countries or certain uh, parts of the world, it was increasing more than others. And so this data was broken down into certain demographics between gender, between developing and developed countries. This is how it was presented to us um, and between uh, children and adults. And so they could ask Vizzy to generate different visualizations so that they could get a better understanding of how uh, obesity levels were varied across these um, dimensions. So this one is for women and girls, and you can see slight variations, and that's what we were interested in them looking at. So like all good HCI, we use the Wizard of Oz rather than programming uh, our Fizzy um, so that we could change um, how we presented the, the prompts. So a Wizard of Oz, for those who are not too familiar, is where you have a human being uh, pretending to be the computer agent. And this is uh, Ethan here, who was our Wizard of Oz, and he had a predefined set of utterances which he'd learnt uh, by heart, and he could then press a button. He was watching the groups working together on the screen here when he thought that they were getting stuck or they hadn't been, um, there was a silence for, uh, for at least three seconds. So he kept the rules really simple as to when he should intervene, and not all the time, because that could get annoying. So. The setup we had was a public display uh, or a large display um, and a smart speaker, which they could talk to to ask Vizzy to generate these um, visualizations. And also, Vizzy would then prompt them at certain points. So, there's a whole experiment uh, that's written up in Tokai if you're interested in the uh, experimental details. But I'm going to, um, for, for today, because we're running out of time, just give you a summary of the findings. And Vizzy's prompts encouraged the teams to generate more hypotheses about the obesity trends, which is what we hoped for. And it got them to focus on the causes behind the different way the lines went. Um, and here's just one quote here, which is, I like that the questions are on finding out more about the data. By answering the question, or even by looking at it, would you think about the consequences? And then would you think, ask yourself, why is this line more steady than the other, which wouldn't necessarily happen without the assistant. So what it's doing is it's getting them to focus on parts of the graph and thinking about what's behind it. Why does it go like that or like that? Which, if you're just presented with a graph, you may not know how to read or, or think about them. So we had lots of examples of that. And here's just a very quick one. Um, there was a silence for 3.5 seconds. And then Vizzy said, what might have caused the sudden spike in this one here? And it's referring to this one here for developed countries. And then uh, the participants are coming up with lots of different explanations, globalization, lots of different food, obviously computers, playstations, children play less outside, get overweight, and so on and so forth. But then they get into specific detail. It's actually quite surprising that there's a 5% increase yeah, even a bit more. And so they start to look at details of the data and then come up with the other hypotheses. So Leon spent ages going through the transcripts to generate these types of um, discussions that went on um, and were very revealing, I think, about how you can use prompts in this way. So conversational agents like this are very different from the auto tutor I showed you. 
because they can be used to just be proactive and prompt at key moments, sparking more in-depth conversations. I think what we found from that study is it got us thinking about what's the, what is it doing, the technology, and it's slowing down the thinking. And we think that's a good idea because it gets people to think more about something than trying to speed up and to, to get a task done. Okay, for the last few minutes, I'm just going to finish off um, talking about Gen AI and the future. We, we all hear in the news and we all have our opinions about the way it's going and, and what it might do in education. I'm not going to touch upon that because I'm sure you're all familiar with those discussions, but just to think about how we might use it in a way that can be engaging and, and promote curiosity and in particular critical thinking skills in children through the art of debate and argumentation. So, so far, Gen AI in education has been used largely to prompt individuals, learners, to reflect about their interactions with the computer. And one of my colleagues from many years ago at Sussex, Mike Sharples, has just written an article I think is really quite uh, provocative, which he suggests we move away from that framing to thinking about it as social generative AI, where humans and generative AI agents engage together in a broad range of interactions. And just like I was saying how I've been inspired by early learning theories, he talks about Pask's theory of persistent conversations, and that's inspired him to come up with this different way of thinking about how we can use generative AI. So just in, um, show you this um, to, to illustrate how you can think about it differently. So at the moment, most of what work has gone on with Gen AI is between an individual user who prompts the AI and the AI comes back with a response. And you get lots of these individuals all working by themselves. Um, what he's proposing, and I know there is a, a, a similar idea called teaming AI, but it's, it's being framed by past work on persistent conversations between humans can talk with each other, they can talk with the AI, and you can have a very different way in which we interact, which can promote different kinds of learning. And so he's arguing that, that we see the, just like, Pass saw the internet as pervasive computational medium, we can start thinking about generative AI in this more social context. And from his paper, um, if you're interested, uh, you just put Mike Sharples and AI and social learning, he suggested lots of different roles that we can have where AI is used to be more cooperative and in this social learning context. And I'm just going to mention the last one, which is Storyteller. Um, which is where we think about how we can use Gen AI with these groups for them to be involved in um, creating new stories that have different um, uh, views and, and experiences. And so the way in which this will happen, um, if you're interested, um, I can give you this slide later, um, is that small groups of children uh, in a classroom uh, discussing elements of story and that story can be about anything for example what lives in the sea and what threats do they face they the children are asked to generate a diversity of views their perspectives and a plot line for the story then they use chat gbt they ask it to open the opening paragraph with these elements they then take that opening paragraph and follow it um, by developing the story more, proposing characters and actions. Then they ask ChatGPT to generate different versions. And it goes on like this, having this interaction with the Gen AI, but in this social context. And then they read on the story that's being evolved and reflect on it for its quality, for its validity and its excitement. So there are different stages by which they're learning these new skills uh, to reflect, to be critical, and even have this metacognitive level to know what is good quality, what is validity, and what counts for excitement. So I think that's a really nice way to think about how we could use ChatGPT in the classroom in a way that uses the tool um, and then for them to build on it and have this discourse. Okay, I'm going to summarize now because I know we're coming to an end, which is that I think what I've tried to show you over these different technologies that I've been working with and developing and designing is that <coughs> we can empower children to think they don't have to take over they don't have to take the learning away from the children we can scaffold and integrate their thoughts we can externalize their cognition through physical manipulation of tangibles we can get them to see new connections between things 
and we can help them to generate and reason and reflect. And I think what uh, in the future, we want to start thinking about supporting new forms of human AI collaboration. And that was one of them. I'm sure you've got your own ideas about how we could do that. So on that note, I'd just like to thank, oh, no, one final slide, which this stuck with me when I first read it. You've all used DALI, I'm sure, or one of these um, tools that you can generate images with. And this is one of the OpenAI engineers when it first came out. He said, DALI is a very useful assistant that amplifies what a person can normally do, but it really is dependent on the creativity of the person using it. It's all down to that person coming up with the prompts and being uh, creative. That may have changed in the last year, but that's something that stuck with me. So I'd just like to thank all my collaborators on the projects I've mentioned, and thank you very much for being a great audience. Uh, thank you very much, Yvonne. Um, terrific to hear from Ambient Wood to thoughts on uh, current AI technologies. Um, do I have any questions from the audience for Yvonne? Or shall I? Yes, Laurie. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I'm just curious with this idea of providing tools to think and to reflect. If you see it as particularly with generative AI, where we may end up with getting people used to being fed prompt things and no longer being able to face the white page. And, and you know, whether it takes the white opportunity to be confronted with, I don't know how to even start thinking about it, but I always get me this really fast. It's a really good point, and I do fear that we we all, we all be taking away something they're like a challenge of a blank page. Um, but some people, students are terrified with that blank page, and they, it takes them forever to get started. And other kids can get started, but I think the proof will be in the pudding as to whether they depend on them. I mean, I think when Google came out, we learned a very different way by which to find out things. We learned how to write you know, to, to search and to write our questions into that search uh, box. And that, um, I think, people just sort of got used to that and kids, just, that's how they learned. And then they learned how to go onto Wikipedia and it did transform how they did their research. You know, they didn't go in the library and read books in the same way. So I suspect we will see uh, a change in how, you know, they think about, they're waiting for a prompt. And maybe that's not such a good thing, but it's, it's here. And what we need to do is think about how do we design it such that that's the only thing they're waiting for or that they have to come up with better prompts themselves so this idea of having a dialogue is what i'm pushing for whether or not that happens i don't know but i do i take your point and it's a very good one is that the more we sort of have these technology interventions the more it changes things and then the kids start to get used to that and rely on that as their way of learning so you try and get a child to do long multiple uh, long multiplication or write doing handwriting or maybe kids can still but we find it much harder so it does transform for better or for worse okay thank you oh, i forgot to say that question but i think you repeated sort of what the question was anyway so any other questions for yvonne Bound. Sorry, what happened in different modalities? And so a lot of the work that you've done is particularly with music or art Sorry, I'm <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I was wondering if you could reflect on your observations about the importance of modalities for children. And so particularly with chat GPT at the moment, a lot of it is going back to text. But at the same time, there's a lot of hype about these different modalities that it can generate, whether they're images and potentially in the future, again, tangible or other outputs if you connect it with a 3D printer. And you've yeah. made a lot of observations. I wonder whether that's how that plays into your observations about learning. I think that's a good point because we're going from, you know, we started off designing multimedia uh, environments for kids and then the internet came along and they could learn interactively. 
And then VR came along and we could do 3D modeling and they could interact with 3D models. And then augmented reality came along and the idea was that you could look around and it would tell you it, digitally, something would pop up and say, that's that river or this is that flower. And so there's been lots of attempts at thinking of different modalities and audio is another one as well that you could hear as you're walking around. Um, I think, you know, personally that it, we should try and use all of the senses or try and encourage that. Uh, sometimes it's hard to do more than two together. Um, and it, it's proved hard to, you know, try and design technology that encourages smells as well as sounds and sights and tastes. One of my colleagues, Mariana Obrist, is trying to do a bit more of that. But it could be that we are now actually, as you suggest, funneling them back down into just looking at text and maybe some images they create. But I suspect that some tools will come along in the next year where um, that might be different, that it won't just be typing into uh, a box what you, you know, and, and having that conversation. I think the idea of having uh, the sort of visual agents, there's something to be said, but there's a lot more research that needs to be done uh, as to whether that's what is a good way to get kids to interact with a visual representation of, of a chatbot. So um, I'm thinking on, on, you know, on my feet here about uh, the directions that we've sort of pushed our children into. With the ambient world, we wanted to have all of it. And it, you could just see that they got so excited be going from the data representations, which were quite abstract, to the experience that they had. And they were able to make that link. And they, that's all rich experience. With the chat GPT, we might find that they're focusing more on abstract ideas. Thanks, Yvonne. I've got a couple of questions online. The first one is from Natalie Lovibond Hodgson, who says, thank you for a great presentation. And she's wondering if you're aware of any work for either initial teacher education or professional development for teachers to develop their data and computational literacy so they can confidently develop innovative learning programs. So awareness of yeah things that help early teachers um, early years teachers to I develop. have to, to say that m much of my focus has been very much on the research side mm. and rather than pulling through because I get I've, I've have been frustrated through my career of having teachers say but we can't we, we, we can't afford that or that's not the you know we don't have time apart from when it came to teaching with tablets that transformed teachers could see the benefits and they were affordable um, so um, part of, um, I get sometimes quite frustrated that some of the ideas we come up with don't go through. Mm. In terms of actual, uh, there's lots of them out there, I think, but which ones are good, which ones, you know, that can help you with thinking about different software packages, different platforms. But in terms of being innovative like this, um, I don't know, I'd have to do a bit of research and come back. Okay, that, that's, that's a great answer and good to know. Uh, we have another question from David Lovell. Thanks for a fascinating present exploration, Yvonne. And David is interested in any comments you have about the motivations of the learners or the role of motivation in these settings. Uh, that's key, motivation, yeah, very much. You, you, sometimes when you go into a classroom and you see kids all you know, sitting there bored and you just think, how do you get over that? How do you get them motivated? How do you get them excited? And I think uh, certainly in the UK, I don't know about so much here, but five-year-olds going into the classroom now, they're already assessed. They have to do little tests for their uh, spelling and, and, then, and then they're put in, already put onto tables as to what their level is. And you can see for those who are high flyers, they're highly motivated, but those who struggle, they're already at that age. Um, and uh, so I think, Motivation is key to everything. And mm. what we've tried to do with all of our technologies and, and the design of the learning experiences is to tap into that and mm. to get kids themselves to be motivated and excited. Um, so yes, I totally yeah. agree. Yeah. Right, um, we're about on three o'clock. Are there any more questions from, oh, we have one more here. Well, I'll take two more questions from the audience. We've got two keen hands from Marie and Kelly. So Marie, please. She's come over from UQ, so. What I'm curious about, Yvonne, is because I love the first uh, study you did that you presented, and I've seen it before, the one in the forest, where the kids actually go out and discover the world. So how do you see the link between 
that and how you got kids so engaged and they use the technology with it. But when we then get into the gen AI and things like that, how would we redo your first project again? <laughs> Um, I think that's a good question is that I was much younger when we did the ambient wood and I had lots of energy and we had less different pressures on us and we worked really hard as a team and you know some of the engineers were and the philosophers and the designers and the artists all worked together it's really hard to get that now to get that team who've got the time to do that sort of thing and so people are much more time pressured and also you have to deliver um, in certain ways. You have to be accountable, you have to show the impact. So I think the, today it's very different and I think I'd struggle to try and do something similar. It's quite, it's a lot easier in some ways to focus on just say chat GPT or AI or a particular um, technology rather than being more ambitious and trying to combine them. So I'm very glad that I was you know, starting my career, but that doesn't mean to say that people who, who are starting their careers now can't also have that sort of ambition and, and drive and think a bit about, well, how can we use augmented reality in, in quite different ways? How can we use, yeah. And um, I still think there is opportunities and, and you know, so hearing some of the research that's going on here, you know, you can see that you know, trying to get kids to get excited by learning outdoors um, is, um, and then bringing it back. And that's some of the stuff that, you know, Margot and her team have been doing. Mm. But it's, it's, yeah, I think it would be much different now than it was back then. Um, I'm sure we would be able to manage to do something. Yeah. Yeah, that was going to be my question too about, so thank you for asking that one. Um, now, just before uh, Kelly's final question, we've got a question snuck in online from Professor, uh, distinguished Professor Susan Danby, who's the oh, yes. uh, Director of the Centre of Excellence for Digital Child, who's very so sorry she can't be here. But she says, thank you for your engaging presentation. I really appreciated the hearing of the trajectory of your research. Her question is, what do you see as the next big issues on the horizon? There are many. There are many. Okay. <laughs> and I think I've touched upon some. I think that we are under, you know, tremendous pressure to see how well our children are doing in order to help them to improve. Mm. And this involves lots of assessment. And I think that is such a challenge because it turns kids off. There's a lot of kids also who haven't gone back to school uh, since pandemic because they've got either long COVID or they've got mental health issues and that's on the rise. So I think there are lots of different challenges around that we didn't have to face. We also have a big rise in uh, neurodiversity uh, and how we deal with that. And I think there's exciting times to develop technology that those children themselves can adapt and, and design uh, to meet their needs. And the, the meet needs are, are quite varied and quite different. I think we need a better understanding of that so that they feel that they are learning to their capacity, that they don't feel left behind. So that's another challenge. Um, in the in the future mm -hmm. but ultimately you want just to see you know, some of those images i showed of kids just being excited and engaged and, and, and enjoying their learning um, and if we can get that right up to 18 year olds that would be great and we saw in that dance class i mean those kids um were just they were taken out of the their normal day-to-day -day classes and brought for this workshop and that was just such an exciting thing for them mm -hmm. so doing things like that having workshops where you bring them together there wasn't much technology in that but there was a lot of thought mm -hmm. went into the design of the workshop so that they felt that they were achieving something so that's another example where i think you know, if we can combine different skills and different uh, ways of getting children to enjoy their learning Thank you. And Kelly, last question. It's easy because I think other people have asked this in different ways, but I'm really curious about your teams um, that you've pulled together for all these different projects because I can see you working across all these modalities and it seems very multidisciplinary. And I'm just curious about what's the importance of that for working with technology for children? I've always worked with people from quite different backgrounds and a lot of it is serendipitous or opportunistic people come to me and say look i'm, I'm working with this theater i hear you've been doing this 
and we try and work out what we can do with them. Uh, this one, the one with the dance, I was invited to go to the Wayne McGregor, who's a big choreographer in the UK. He's got this big new studio and they were trying to put academics together with uh, choreographers and it was a competition. And some of the, the people you saw wanted to work with us because we could build a technology. And so that's how that happened. Um, and so oftentimes it is, uh, you haven't planned it. Um, and then I think, well, who else can we bring in on this that would make sense to do that? And I suppose it's a skill that I've developed is working out who to who can work well together. You can have smaller teams, but you know I think it's really good to have teams of six to ten, if possible, to do these bigger projects. But recently, because of COVID, I've had to go much smaller. So there's just been two or three of us, and we have worked, for example, for the last five or six years with Great Ormond Street Hospital. That is a hospital uh, for uh, very sick children. And they really like working with people who've got innovative ideas for technology. And so we've established a relationship with them and have been doing lots of projects with um, very young kids and how to help them you know, with their moods and their, their feelings of well-being or not. So and Matt can be working with clinicians and nurses uh, as well. So. I think I just sort of, you know, see opportunities when they arise. There's no, you know, and, and just trying to make sure everyone feels that they're making a contribution and that they get something out of it. I always put people who aren't academics as co-authors who've been involved in the papers. Um, and I think that's really important to show that you, know, you appreciate all the work they've done. And they think, oh, look, I'm on, a, um, on an academic publication. So I think there are various ways in which you can keep people happy and engage them and get the most out of different disciplines and skills. Thank you very much, Yvonne. Thank you, uh, everyone online who came to the webinar. And thank you to about 20 people in the room here. Uh, you're all invited to join us at the Botanicals uh, Bar on campus, which is um, open and at last yesterday I went to see and there, well, there was only me in it and the, the both the bartenders were playing pool. So I think they'd welcome our um, patronage. Uh, so you're all invited. Thank you very much, um, Yvonne. It's been fabulous to kick off our year and get us thinking in this hot Brisbane summer and uh, look forward to continuing to collaborate with you and uh, hearing what you're working on too. Thank you. And thank you to everyone who's watched it online. And also again, thanks to the Digital Child for and making it happen and all the best for this year and i hope to see as many of you in the room in the bar but obviously not those of you online okay thank you all bye-bye <laughs>